So welcome everybody uh, to today's webinar production. We're going to be talking about the uh, state of operations and, and where the hell outsourcing is going. Uh, in 2018, we just finished a fantastic survey um, with, uh, with our friends at KPMG. We spoke with over 381 enterprise leaders within the Global 2000. And I'm delighted to be joined by some excellent people I'll introduce shortly uh, for, today's, for today's session. Here they are. So uh, myself, Phil Fest, I'm the CEO and Chief Analyst at HFS Research, and I'm joined by uh, three very esteemed colleagues, and I'm going to get them to introduce themselves briefly. So first and foremost, uh, Mr. Dave Brown of KPMG. Thanks again uh, for uh, yet another uh, outstanding survey and, and output, and I'm excited to be on the um, discussion today. For those that I haven't had a chance to meet, um, I'm the global lead for KPMG Shared Services Outsourcing Practice and have been in that role for just over seven years. Um, looking forward to the next hour. Let's get uh, our other guest today, uh, Rich Purley, the CEO and EVP of uh, Global Services and Process Excellence at Beckton Dickinson. Rich? Yeah, hi, Rich Purley here. Um, you know, as Phil mentioned, responsible for, you know, IT uh, shared services process I've uh, been with uh, Becton Dickinson for, uh, you know, seven years in various roles, um, you know, as well as a number of years in, in consulting. Looking forward to the conversation today. Should be a good one. Excellent. Uh, and uh, my colleague, Saurabh Gupta, who's our Chief Strategy Officer at HFS. Uh, yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks, Phil. Uh, my name is Saurabh. I'm the Chief Strategy Officer here at HFS, which essentially means I look after our research function and I'm looking forward to this discussion. Fantastic, sorry, welcome. Excellent, great, glad we got you on there. So we've uh, got a pretty detailed agenda today. We're going to talk about uh, the role of uh, GBS, and it needs to pivot from internal delivery to more of a focus around one office. Um, we're going to proclaim that outsourcing is actually not dead, uh, but only 30% of contracts will actually survive as is in their current state. We're going to be um, also talking about the future of digital operations we'll be digging into all the key change agents that are driving digital uh, like rpa uh, blockchain analytics etc so we'll be getting deep into that and, and we'll also be hearing a lot from rich over at beckton dickinson who's getting his hands pretty dirty in a lot of the emerging technologies uh, and, then we'll talk, and then we'll talk about yeah. Okay, and uh, and then we'll also talk a bit about the changes that we're going to see happening and we can expect to see happening with internal roles and the need to build more partnerships externally. And as I said, we'll be hearing a lot from Rich as we go through today's presentation. Um, and so, and so we're going to start with, I think, the encouraging news is that outsourcing uh, is not actually dead it's actually um, uh, maturing and you can see here we ran this same study in 2016 as we did recently just a couple of months ago and you can see here that um, operations leaders are planning to increase uh, their focus on outsourcing over the next three years uh, it's it's decreasing in certain industries like banking and insurance uh, than it was a couple of years ago which is unsurprising considering the saturation points of those industries, but we're actually starting to see industries like um, telecom and high tech and energy, which have lagged a little bit uh, in terms of outsourcing from the other industries, actually increasing uh, what they're actually doing here. And as we look at the uh, impacts on offshoring over the last um, four years. We've actually been doing this study with KPMG for several years now, so we've been able to do some really um, excellent comparatives between the data and when we ran the study in 2014 across the Global 2000, uh, companies were still very focused on increasing the offshore elements across both their outsourcing and shared services. 
you know, in, interest levels, you know, above 20% for some areas like finance and accounting, procurement and IT. Um, but as the uh, times changed and, you know, we saw the uh, election of 2016, I think the intentions to offshore uh, diminished quite significantly and then in 2018 they diminished further so it's pretty flat now when uh, enterprises are looking out uh, at what they're doing uh, with their own um, uh, with their own activities here um, so what's interesting is the fact that you know while we're seeing um, outsourcing increase at the same time we're actually um, you know we're actually seeing um, you know the, the intentions to offshore actually reduce and then one of the areas I think which is of significant importance here is when we ask the operations leads about interest in um, investing in uh, RPA as a cost cutting vehicle you can see here that um, that significant investment is being made by 50% plus of most enterprises here so telecom for example executives are looking at outsourcing and doing automation in droves uh, in areas like insurance and BFS, where the outsourcing is fairly mature at this point, uh, you can see very high levels of focus looking at RPA, and that's very similar when we look at retail and energy as well. So we're seeing uh, quite a significant spike um, in interest in RPA, in addition to that which we're seeing in, in outsourcing, and we'll get more into this debate as we as we go through a lot of today's um, a lot of today's slides. Uh, the other thing I wanted to, to point out here. Was the fact that um, only 30% of today's existing outsourcing contracts are currently safe. So a third of clients are likely to renew with their current outsourcer with a similar contract with very little change. What we're actually seeing here is 17% uh, are looking to maybe do more automation and bring work back. 27% uh, are actually likely to try and change their provider and 27% uh, are looking to renew with their current outsourcer, but are looking at a lot more focus around outcomes and a lot uh, larger increases around automation. So from a high level, that's what we're seeing in the industry right now. And I'd like to now um, shift a little bit to Dave Brown, who's going to talk a bit about the role of GBS and how that needs to pivot from internal delivery to focus and drive more than one office. Hey, thanks, Phil. Uh, one of the things that you mentioned, which uh, before we get into the, um, the the pivot, is when we look at the outsourcing slide, when you're talking about what's you know being uh, reduced in the offshoring mix, you know, a lot of the RPA technologies are addressing some of those uh, transaction type uh, tasks, repeatable tasks uh, that uh, a lot of third parties and outsourcing agreements. Uh, really transitioned over to the offshore. So we're starting to see, I think you mentioned it very nicely, with, when we're talking about going back and looking at outsourcing agreements, we do see a lot of activity and clients are taking a look at restructuring those outsourcing agreements. But what they're doing is they're taking out the play around offshoring and actually looking at automation to reduce that offshore mix. So it's, it's a very dynamic, um, I would say, correlation between the two as we're seeing that as an uptick. And I know um, Rich, when, when you guys are looking at your uh, current landscape, you guys have actually taken a hard look at the automation play as well. Yeah, absolutely. We'll talk more in a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, I know you'll get into it in a bit. So let's talk a little bit about this pivot that we're talking about. You know, and, and first off, um, you know, we'll, we'll get into some of the details that will sustain it. But one of the things that we definitely are seeing is that GBS and those companies that are driving towards GBS like organizations are looking at a, a pivot from internally delivering uh, focus to now moving to this one office concept that Phil and the HFS team have been talking about for the last couple of years. And what do we really mean by that is, is that companies really are looking at driving more of a strategic dialogue as we're looking at all the enabling technologies, whether it's intelligent automation, whether it's data analytics, and trying to, trying to build those organizations to be more enterprise focused, not just back office, but how are they in incorporating those types of solutions in the front, middle, and back offices, or um, back offices. And, and the thing that we're, we're finding is that clients that are being successful in this pivot are those that are really becoming more um, customer centric, and they're really trying to drive more of a, um, 
I would say, a, a, an intelligent support function and behind that that really is addressing the customer needs across the entire enterprise. So we can go into the next slide. What we're looking at is, oh, sorry, go back up one. So we we'll asked the question for, you know, where are we seeing the trends in, in GBS organizations? Um, and as Phil's mentioned, we've got some great data that goes historically as well, but you can see the increase in these GBS organizations, not just today, but what the projection is. But we're also increasingly saying focus on these functional shared services. And a lot of times in what I have just described as these enabling technologies um, that are in the data analytics, it's sometimes for companies, it's hard to take that leap to do it across multiple functions in a GBS organization at the same time. So we are seeing a little bit more focus around these functional shared service centers to incorporate those solutions and to get them right as they transition into more of a GBS or multifunctional service delivery model. So moving on to the next slide. Um, always love this question, right? You know, how critical are, are the following C-suite directives? And you ask about mission critical. Um, and Phil, I think we joke about this every year that we talk about it is, you know, the number one is always driving down costs. Um, and we've seen though um, repeatedly over the years um, uh, or last two years, the adopt automation um, and also the alignment on the front, middle and back office to prove that customer experience really ramp up in the last uh, two years to where this year it's number two and number three. Um, we also see though in, in the increasingly important what I was spoke, or mentioning around the AI and the smart analytics to drive more of a touchless operations. And we're starting to hear buzzwords like boundaryless organizations, which means we're starting to see companies build out capabilities within those GBS organizations versus this is the finance data analytics group versus an HR data analytics group. We're starting to see those capabilities build out. And then on the last part, the emerging top three, you know, this is really going beyond the operations itself and really starting to drive more of that entrepreneurial type culture and really making it more hyper personal. And, and we've got some other information in the back. I noticed that it was so emerging that we actually emerged them from three to two, but that'll be another discussion. Move on to the next slide. So one of the things that we've talked about in the past and it's in, in the data reassures this is how fast this is changing, right? And it's only going to get faster. So the pace of change um, that we saw right now, when we look at um, um, how significant the change is, um, it, you know, it's it, the companies are saying and the respondents are saying that it's going to be only um, become more increasingly important in the next two years. And at these GBS organizations that are getting set up, not only are they taking advantage of the technologies um, to build out uh, the capabilities, but those capabilities are more agile uh, to be able to address the, the change of pace that is coming down um, in the next two years. A lot of clients have actually already seen um, some of their technology they put in that they're actually looking to, to have upgrades that are done, or as they look, move and deploy that across multiple functional areas, they found themselves actually having to step back and reset that strategy because the technology or the solutions that they're looking to deploy have changed already. So this is one that, you know, as we're advising our clients is to what's that roadmap look like um, from a technology um, portfolio has to be agile and has to be flexible enough to, to be able to uh, adopt and embrace this type of change. So on the next one. So some of you have seen this evolution before um, uh, or variations of this maybe in some other publications or research. Um, and I dare to say some of, some of you and some of us have lived this um, and you've seen the change in these delivery models um, over the decades. Where we're at right now is we're seeing this, this shift um, to everything being digital and digital is a wide open um, um, tag to actually put on these types of organizations. But what we're really saying is that it, technology is affecting every part of the service delivery model. And one of the things that we're, we're trying to ensure is that these uh, solutions that are being deployed really are, are adaptable. 
um, and they're adaptable not just to the back office anymore, but how are they being ad integrated with the middle and the front office? Um, how does big data and driving predictable analytics play a role in this, not only again by functional, but how does it go across the entire enterprise? And then um, the one thing that um, we have a lot of conversations with our, our, our clients is how do they become more of a strategic partner going forward with all the enabling technology and the pace of change and how do you really drive the value of what those solutions can bring to the entire organization? Um, just as a quick note, I, I was in with um, a large insurance company and we were talking about the operation side uh, changing and the functional leads were all excited about being that next strategic um, provider or innovator for the company and, and bringing really a lot of value added services forward. And um, uh, the COO at the time um, made, a, made a little bit of a joke, said this is great as we look you know, in 2020 and beyond, everybody is gonna be a strategic advisor who's gonna actually run the operations. And so as we look at these organizations being developed over time and as virtual as they become and as automated as they become, never lose sight that somebody still has to monitor and manage these organizations. So we're still looking at um, that is going in the, in the future, but there's going to be services that are delivered obviously much more virtually. And as I said in the past, more boundaryless. Excellent. And then, uh, thanks to to yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so I've got a couple of questions already coming in, so people can type their questions into the right-hand dashboard of their screens. And, um, you know, someone's asked, you know, in terms of offshore, um, is it your view that it's because offshoring is done, or is it because it's just not as cost competitive as it once was and, and it's too regulated these days? What's, your, what's been your experience in the last couple of years? Yeah, definitely the the last year, what we've seen with the, with those clients that have actually taken down their offshoring uh, was a direct result of what they've been able to automate. Um, most of them had their their captives or their third parties that were set up to do those transactional type of activities. Um, what they have done though, which which may not be evident in in the numbers, is that they're actually now looking at those offshore models for that next level or of um, skill set. So the analytics part of that. So building out the data and analytics scientists or analysts is really what they're looking for and building out with the uh, um, some of the offshore uh, resources that are there. So it's really directly related to the uh, automation for those transaction services. It's interesting. Okay. And um, another question here around, uh, is there a specific industry segment that you are seeing from your vantage point that has a better opportunity? to create relative GBS success? You mentioned industries with a focus on customer, but what is what is the correlation in your perspective? Yeah, we're, we're seeing those. It, it's maybe not um, directly related to the customer that's driving the GBS, but it's really the, the culture of the um, organizations themselves. So we know that within CPG, we've seen a lot of uptake in the last several years and driving to these multifunctional environments um, and being able to get the synergies related to it. We see some of the high tech ones right now starting to ramp up into that as they're able to um, embrace the enabling technologies and deploy those similar solutions across the entire organization. Uh, the ones that we're still seeing that, that may struggle a little bit are more um, industrial manufacturing, which are still fairly siloed, although there are some organizations that have been pushing towards it, we still see that those are a little bit sub-optimized. So it's a little bit around uh, all over the place, uh, Phil. We, we do have some that have been pretty mature in, in their GBS journey um, that have felt that the disruption of technology and or data um, has caused them to look at maybe looking a little bit more functionally and building out some of those capabilities I was talking about. Excellent. Thank you, Dave. Good. All right. So, so moving on, I think let's um, I think let's let's start sort of talking a bit about this sort of pivot to uh, the one office. So, you know, the reason why we've been pretty excited about the one office at HFS is, um, you know, because it's really this shift of really immersing digital into into the operating model. And then I think when we 
started with basic digital, which is I think where we're kind of emerging from now. This is really all about responding to customer needs kind of as and when they happen. Um, and it's using interactive tools and technologies to do that. And I think where one office is getting interesting, it's where enterprises can start to anticipate customer needs before they actually happen. And it means having you know, un unattended and in unattended interactions with data sources, both inside and outside of the enterprise. So you're looking at things like macroeconomic data, compliance issues, competitive intel, geopolitical issues, that sort of thing. So it's getting almost getting to the point where it, organizations are so intelligent they're going to start interacting with each other and not necessarily always relying on manual processes to make things shift and you know I think one of the reasons why we're sort of looking at things in this way is up until now I feel a lot of these initiatives like outsourcing in many respects were always focused on the incremental and not necessarily on, on the outcome. So it was how can we shave a 20% more here, 30% there, as opposed to really thinking about what do we want our framework and end state to look like. And this really helps map out how they want to look in the future. And a true digital business really can't succeed in our opinion without unifying the front, the middle, and the back office uh, traditional approaches. And many of them have failed because they didn't have that purpose of really trying to figure out um, how to sort of create an underbelly that really supports the organization almost like a nervous system where data is unified, um, it's cloudified, it's secure, it's digitized. You know, we're looking at that data underbelly, really figuring out how to structure the data more effectively so you can then look at doing some automation under the processes. And then you can start to think about having intelligent support functions that can work more autonomously. They can start to wrap um, their their needs and their goals around the needs of the customer. So we're starting to sort of look at broader processes that might be something like customer to cash instead of order the cash or customer to pay instead of procure to pay. And we're starting to see even elements of things like lean, which is quite a, a closely related to design thinking coming into play as we start to design processes in a way that can be anticipatory, that can really help businesses become much more intelligent. Because it's not just about archiving data and acting on historical information. It's about delivering predictive data to make decisions down the road. And you know, when we start to think about how to get there, we've got to remember that you know, the customer experience is not just a fancy UI, right? You know, it, it, it's gotta be the core of all your business operations right from front to back. Um, you have to sometimes weed out people unprepared to change. And it's absolutely true that, that you have to have an inclusive strategy where, you're, where, you're, where your staff share information, uh, they work together on projects, they learn what is a quick win and then another quick win, that sort of thing. And if some people are just unprepared to move with the needle, they're unprepared to become more inclusive, you know, at some point organizations are having to figure out the right sort of people they need as they move into the future. And then we need to think about these co-innovation relationships. So in many cases, the partners who may have got us here might not be the ones to take us where we want to go. And it'd be great to hear a bit more from Dave and Rich about this as well. You know, we need to start to think about relationships with analytics firms, with digital firms, with fintech type businesses, health tech type businesses, et cetera. So the whole ecosystem is going through a sort of rapid shift right now and, and, it, and uh, the, the the enterprises I talk to are really rethinking how they're um, setting up their relationships and where they really need to go. And I'll finally, before I move on to Sorab, is that we've got to stop thinking about this future of work, right? The future is here, it's now. You know, we are now in the future of work in the present. You know, we're seeing a lot of these applications being deployed where we're only using maybe 10 to 20% of the functionality. So I think the exciting thing about today is it is here, it is now, and now we're all on this massive education mission to learn, to really think about what works, what doesn't work, and how can we make this happen. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna move on to my colleague, Saurabh, who's gonna start to talk about this shift towards digital operations. Thanks, Bill. So you're right, the future is already here, and we are starting to see a number of these emerging change agents or uh, technologies that offer credible value, but we need to get a handle on these, right? Robotic process automation is starting to become mainstream. We are starting to see elements of uh, artificial intelligence, especially machine learning, natural language processing, computer vision, uh, starting to find their feet. 
uh, uh, IoT um, uh, use cases are sprouting across most industries. Uh, blockchain or distributed ledger technologies are starting to offer a future, sort of a disruptive future vision. So, so there is there is a lot of promise from these uh, change agents. However, adoption of these emerging technologies is not that easy, and there are multiple challenges uh, that uh, we all need to prepare to reach the so-called promised land. So, so let's let's sort of discuss uh, in a little more detail on what what is it that organizations really need to do um, to to sort of uh, move the needle. So when we ask the survey respondents their uh, sort of investment focus around these emerging technologies, it painted a fairly interesting picture. RPA, cloud, IoT are leading the sort of mind share uh, of investments today. But going forward over the next uh, year or so, uh, AI, smart analytics are, and blockchain are emerging. So we we are not really talking about a five-year horizon here. We are we are just talk, we are just looking at a 12 to 18 month horizon, where all these sort of six uh, different emerging change agents are going to have a huge impact on on the digital operations industry. So let's let's look at uh, 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 robotic process automation, right? And the rise of robotic process automation has been nothing short of spectacular. Uh, it, it sort of promises cost savings beyond labor arbitrage. Uh, it promises cost avoidance by extending the life of your legacy IT. It, it sort of promises much quicker implementation than traditional IT uh, projects. And, and let's be honest, it's been a terrific marketing activity <laughs> of calling it a robotic process automation to get it to where it is. Having said that, there is a lot of confusion in the market also, right? Uh, there are growing questions around whether it can sort of deliver on the promised ROI and outcomes. Uh, most initiatives today that we see are, are also small and piecemeal. There are very few instances where uh, RPA has been truly scaled. So to, to really dig deeper, we, we did this study recently where we interviewed about 350 actual users of uh, the 10 leading RPA products to, to benchmark customer experience across 40 different dimensions. And as you can see on this page, uh, RPA does work uh, in terms of its ability to process simple structured data, in terms of uh, it working with your legacy IT, in terms of covering a, a broad range of horizons, uh, but it is not a magic wand. It is, uh, it is not as fast uh, as it was advertised. Uh, it, it's hard to sort of use RPA for processing unstructured data. Uh, it, uh, it, you, you really need to have uh, a programmatic approach to reap benefits from uh, RPA and uh, need to invest uh, in change management. So let me let me actually bring in uh, Richard in the conversation here. Uh, and Richard, one of the questions that we've received is, what is the biggest obstacle to scaling automation at the enterprise level? I know you've got tons of experience in dealing with AI and cognitive. What What in your experience is the biggest obstacle? I mean, you know, I, I think you, you talked a little bit about the change management, and so there's there's a most organizations, you know, ours as, as well as others. I think it's a healthy skepticism around, you know, you know, is this another shiny object, and can it do, you know, everything that we thought it can do, right? You know, and you know, overselling it. So, um, you know, what we try to do is is uh, you know take the pilot approach, um, you know, work with you know internal stakeholders. And make sure that we're trying to solve a business problem. Um, for for all of us in these jobs, you know, it's got to start with the business strategy. You know, business strategy then you know you know leads into okay, what what are the business outcomes that we need to drive, and then what are those you know foundational capabilities that we need in order to enable those business outcomes. You know, so you know automation or outsourcing or any of these tools, shared services, you know, captive centers, what what have you. It's all you know part of our you know, palette of capabilities, you know, that we need to work back into the organization and really help them, you know, drive, drive the outcome to support their strategy. So for us, it's, it's really been a journey of, you know, who is, uh, you know, who is like a shining light in the organization that we can work with so that they can start to carry the message because, you know, um, for many of the, the, the shared services in IT, you know, there's, there, there may be trust issues. And so how do you, how do you build those connectors and how do you build, um, 
you know, a foundation so that you can start to extend and build. Um, because, you know, I think to a lot of the points that you guys have made already, um, you know, we, we are very encouraged about, you know, what this can provide. But again, it's, it's part of an overall, you know, system, an overall framework on how you're going to deliver, you know, services and ultimately outcomes for your customers. No, that's uh, that's very true, uh, Rich. So thank you. Uh, and I, I think ultimately what enterprise are, enterprises are seeking through all these emerging technologies, change agents, et cetera, are business outcomes. And as you can see on the right-hand side of, uh, of this chart, uh, that's going to be possible through an, uh, an integrated solution, right? Where we're leveraging the power of AND across these emerging technologies, across solutions that sort of bring in RPA, analytics, AI, et cetera, together to really solve a business problem. And we at HFS really believe in what we call the AAA trifecta of automation, analytics, and AI. And, and potentially the intersection of these technologies is, is where uh, you can actually drive real business outcomes to, to what Rich was saying. And I think it's again not far behind. Uh, we're not very far away from from this sort of a triple A trifecta, because if you look at the left hand side of of this page, uh, yes, RPA is further ahead in terms of adoption. But if you look at the next two years, we see the adoption across RPA analytics and AI to be pretty similar. Um, so we are we are not very far behind, and and beyond beyond uh, robotic process automation, uh, analytics, AI, machine learning, et cetera, we're also seeing uh, this rapid increase in the use cases uh, for Internet of Things. Um, it's sort of the, the next industrial revolutions and IoT is, is at the core, is, is the fundamental core technology behind it. Uh, when we did our research, uh, we found that the IoT professional services market is roughly $10 billion already, uh, and it's expected to grow at 30%. Uh, it's, it's fairly obvious that manufacturing and energy and utilities are sort of uh, uh, are leading the engagement uh, with roughly 22 and 15% adoptions. But uh, the, the thing to note here again is that despite it being a fairly large and fairly fast growing market, this space is still very nascent. Uh, uh, we, we see at least 500 different IoT platforms that are out there. Uh, and there's a huge amount of technology fragmentation. Uh, when we reached out to clients and understood what are the reasons behind, what are the big challenges? I think there is a lot of resistance to change internally. Uh, a lot of the legacy systems are not really compatible uh, with these things. And there's there's a general sort of lack of understanding on the ROI and the uh, and the promise that IoT can bring to the table. So it's it's promising, but it's challenging at the same time. And same goes with uh, the blockchain. Now, distributed ledger technologies, or what we've started to sort of call blockchain, is is also capturing the hearts and minds of uh, of all of us uh, because they they fundamentally sort of can change our business models potentially as significant as the internet itself, uh, and we're starting to see an explosion of uh, of proof of concepts and prototypes uh, in in blockchain. But as you can see from this chart, real in production environments are are very, very few and far between. Um, and and in fact, if you peel the onion and look at some of these production uh, sort of uh, environments for blockchain, they're pretty much shadow or parallel uh, production environments uh, where clients are still hesitant to leave behind their legacy uh, infrastructure, IT infrastructure, and move completely to blockchain. And, and the reason behind that is that uh, blockchain like any new technology is going through what i call the 991 adoption challenge where 90 percent of the enterprises don't still don't have a clue uh, nine percent of the enterprises are figuring out where to start and there's probably only one person who is doing something credible and until we sort of develop the management practices behind the technology uh, i think it's going to be a hard uh, hard hard challenge uh, to move the needle Having said that, all these all these emerging uh, technologies offer a huge impact, uh, um, but they also 
uh, but they also uh, have a potentially large impact on existing roles. Uh, and to discuss that and the impact on people, I'd like to pass the baton back to Phil. Phil, over yeah, to you. Thank you, thank you Sarah. Um, yeah, so back to the uh, back to the study, and um, yeah, we had to ask the operations leads that you know what what proportion of their staff in in transactional areas were going to be impacted by automation in the next couple of years, and you can see here um, around 50% of employees in the transactional areas you know are expecting to be uh, impacted and i think this now brings to bear probably the most important challenge of our industry that we're going to face in the next probably two to five years um, which is how do we retrain people how do we retain them what you know what are the strategies i'm getting questions just coming in right now about you know what's the average you know fte reduction for an rpa implementation things like that and so you know, a lot of this is around um, slimming down and smartening up and building teams that are more relevant for the future. So we asked the staff, um, the enterprises in the survey, you know, what their priority was. Um, and 57% um, are looking to maybe retain and retrain um, their, their people uh, who are going to be impacted. 43%, however, uh, are in the balance. And you know, we, we actually asked the same question of a private poll of folks. This was at our HFS summit in New York in March. And we had about 112 uh, enterprise leaders doing a private poll. And we asked them um, you know, their plans for staff impacted by automation in the next couple of years. And I think the results here are simple. 40% just don't know. I mean, they haven't got a plan and they, they won't have for a while. And I do think it's this lack of a plan which can impact a lot of companies who are relatively new to this and are still trying to figure out where this is all going. You know, I personally have seen quite marked differences when I've gone to sort of big RPA customer events in the UK versus the US. The UK tends to be a little ahead with RPA. A lot of UK companies adopted this three, four, even five years ago and are fairly experienced now with where this is going. Whereas uh, the US customer conferences, it tends to be fairly new and, and the people are still staring starry eyed into this uh, lovely concept of automation and where it's all going to go and improve things. Uh, and I'd love to get some inputs from both Dave and Rich here. Maybe, maybe Dave, you could kick off uh, this conversation around what do we do with um, staff who are impacted? How do you find your clients are approaching this? What types of advice do you give? you know, as a KPMG advisor, you know, where do you see this shifting and how critical do you think this issue is right now? Thanks, Phil. Um, you know, it's interesting how you say that, um, you know, people are saying they don't know what they're going to do. This is in addition to the, the heightened discussions around, you know, what can I do for automation? This is, this is the number one question we get asked. What do we do with the people? Um, you know, we've had similar conversations, again, some of us that have been around for some of the decades to see some of the changes in the marketplace. And um, we had similar questions about if I've outsourced all of these functions, what do I do with my retained staff? Um, this is a little bit different um, in that we actually have folks that have some deep functional skill sets, um, institutional knowledge, and really we're starting to build out succession planning um, for what those retained organizations uh, need to look like and also what that succession planning training curriculum needs to look like for the future. Um, and that, that serves for two purposes. It serves for those that are in the existing roles, but it also starts laying the framework for the new types of employees that are being hired in and they setting the right expectations for them as they come into the organization. Because one of the things that we're seeing um, for right now with a lot of this automation is that what we're calling the next generation of leaders coming in is they don't necessarily see what that career path looks like for them. And so those clients that actually we're advising on right now is building out what does that career path look like that includes the automation uh, portfolio has been very well received and shows that they do have a path and a direction. And then you mirror that with what are those tools that and skill sets that they need to develop over time to be able to actually hit that career succession. Interesting, okay. and. Um... You know, as, as clients look to figure out where they're going with this then and the reskilling and retraining that they need, I'll share a couple more data points uh, just, just, you know, to get your sort of take on this a bit, which is um, 
we asked them, you know, how are you looking at external partners to achieve your sea level directives? You can actually see here that, um, you know, well over half of enterprises are looking externally for help across all these areas like virtual operations, real time data, customization of products, uh, process automation, et cetera. And then um, this final piece of data, which um, was actually from a study we conducted separately of 100 C level executives, is we asked, we asked them what was holding them back on their journey to achieving like a digital one office framework. And you can see the business C suite here. We, uh, we cut them in, in two between business and IT. Um, they see a, um, a lack of digital mindset, legacy thinking from both IT and the business as the biggest impediment to getting to the promised land, so to speak. Whereas when we look to expect the IT C-suite, while they also agree there's a mindset issue from business and IT, um, they overwhelmingly said they have a talent shortage in using a lot of these tools and capabilities to get there. So, I mean, Dave, when you start to look at where the obstacles are internally in terms of talent and getting where they need to get to, do you think it's this shortfall in, in the IT expertise which is going to hold companies back eventually? Do you think this is going to drive you know, more partnerships with outsourcing providers as examples or, or some of these tools vendors? How do you see, how do you see uh, enterprises overcoming this skills issue? So it's across the board, Phil. It's not a, um, you know, one size is going to fit all. It depends on what is actually being deployed, um, what what skills are are required in different industries and what's in different functions. You know, you talk about the uh, one office concept and we talk about boundaryless organizations. For a, a employee to move through the um, uh, organization and, and maybe accelerate their career path um, or have a career path, their skills that are required are a multitude. And in some cases for an organization to look for those types of skills that are scarce today, they're gonna to have to have a combination of employees that are, that are in, reinvested in, but also third parties that aren't just a one-stop shop. There isn't a provider out there right now that's going to be able to supply those types of skill sets because they're struggling with finding those capabilities themselves. So you do have a mix here of, um, I'll say the, the, what would have been traditional functional only domain expertise that has to be coupled with um, IT, uh, a technical background, analytic background that is just gonna be coupled together. Um, you know, we've made jokes about, you know, the aging workforce and the transition that they've gone through and a lot of the finance type folks that maybe used a calculator back in the day um, thought Excel was revolutionary, right? And moving forward, started to look at the analytic tools that came out and some of the BI tools early on. Now, as you start looking at the automation that can come in and some of the more predictive capabilities in the analytics space, it's a different tool set for them. Um, I know I, the, the resistance to change um, and, and the having people feeling though that they can't move into that, sometimes it's creating that opportunity for them to actually expand into that. So I know I'm a little rambled at the end, Phil, but it's, it's gotta be a combination of things to look at those labor pools and it's hard for an organization to think that it's just going to be themselves that be able to draw from that. And that's why we've made the comment in the past that we don't see outsourcing as dead. We just see the mix of skill sets and the technology solutions that they can bring are going to ever changing. Thank you, Dave. And um, you know, at this point, I'd love to hear more from Rich Perley, uh, particularly around the skills and change issues. Um, see, pearls of wisdom, as we've, um, I'm sure you've heard this one before, Rich. Of course. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's, it, never, it never gets old. Um, so, yeah, I, I was I was thinking about you know what what Dave was saying, and you know one one of the things you know that we've done, and you know it, you know the the uh, you know today's organizational structures, I think are are one of the things that I, I, all of us need to look at because they actually limit our ability to be effective in, in working across technology, working across process, working across you know uh, you know bringing the data together. Um, and so, you know, that's one of the things we've done in the last, you know, 10 months is really, you know, knock down that one barrier and, you know, create a different really mashup of, of how people, you know, are starting to think about things and work together. And that also includes our partners because, you know, some of the skills, 
you know, we don't have, we need from our partners. Some of the skills our partners may not have, and we may need to go, you know, to some, some type of syndicated labor uh, solution. So, you know, we, you, you really need to kind of throw a lot of the old playbooks out and, you know, find, you know, the people that have the right mindset, you know, that are curious, that are problem solvers, that really, uh, you know, can help you. You know, and that's one of the challenges that, um, you know, that we're trying to do within, within our organization, whether you're in a shared service center in, you know, Santiago, Chile, or, you know, or whether you're, you know, in IT in, in, in New Jersey, right? How do you reimagine, you know, the work that you're doing today? Because we have critical shortages in a number of areas inside of our company. So the more that we can get people's mind around, you know, what, you know, you know design your future, whether it's, you know, security, right? You know, which we have a tremendous shortage, you know, not just at our company, but across the world, uh, big data, uh, you know, robotics, uh, you know, RPA. And so how do we, you know, kind of retool because we actually don't want to lose the business knowledge that these people have because we spent a lot of time investing in them and we need that because, you know, especially with our growth trajectory and where we want to go as an organization, you know, of, of advancing the world of health, you know, we need a lot of these folks to make the journey with us, right? And so as I go out and talk to people across our organization, it's really about, you know, getting them pumped up to get them to imagine how they can fit. Right now, is everybody going to make the journey? You know, probably not. But we need more people than not to make the journey with us, you know, as we reskill the organization. Um, and, you know, it's, it's exciting, but at the same time, you know, it's a lot of work because, you know, it's not just about bringing our organization, it's all of our stakeholders along with us so that they can, you know, have confidence in our ability to really, you know, help them with the business outcomes. And again, it comes back to those capabilities and making sure that we, we are working through that mix of, of skill sets that we need to deliver. And, you know, as, um, as you look at the partnerships that you're forging to take you to this kind of, you know, from where you came from to where you want to go, do you find they're changing dramatically? You know, you know, we, I talked to other folks in, in your types of role, Rich, who are talking more about, you know, working much more closely with, with deep analytics firms, um, with a lot more tech sort of specialists and, and maybe sometimes using their traditional outsource as more of a kind of baseline for, for sort of staffing. I mean, it, it, would you say your mix is changing considerably or is it fairly gradual? Well, I mean, I think it's, you know, uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a little story. You know, I went out in December and did a West Coast trip with, uh, with all of our software partners. You know, and I had a meeting with, uh, you know, one of the leading software companies. And, you know, they, they probably, you know, we, we spent a fair amount of money with them, but it's not a, I would call a deep relationship. And I asked the leader there, I said, so how many, uh, how many friends do you have? Right. And this is a pretty senior guy. Um, he's like, you know, I, I've got, you know, 20 or 30 friends. And I'm like, okay. I said, how many real friends do you have? Truly, you know, people that, you know, you're going to have a beer with every, every weekend. And he goes about six. And the reality is with most of us is I've only got six slots for partners to help me with mind share. Now, it doesn't mean that I'm not listening to everybody. And so what I'm really looking for is who can I go deep with on some of these topics, understanding that, you know, everybody's talking about blockchain, everybody's talking about RPA, but who really gets it and who can really be that partner? Because I don't have that much time where I can spend, you know, trying to sift through, you know, what everybody's telling me, because there's, there's a whole signal to noise challenge, I think that all of us as leaders that are, are having. And so how do we get to those focused conversations and really, you know, have uh, a relationship where we can experiment and really do some cool stuff with? Because, you know, all of us are experimenting. All of us are trying to find, you know, what's going to work, you know, for our companies. And I think, you know, that, that's really one of the things, you know, that I'm looking for. I think we've got a couple partners right now who, you know, we're starting to go deep with, um, you know, but, you know, there, there are slots open. So uh, we, 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 we you know, we're, we're looking to, you know, continue to advance that. It's interesting you say that. So as you look at a lot of these sort of experimental conversations that are happening, um, do you think this is a sort of phase we're going through right now 
or do you think this is just the way it is people are feverishly looking at new stuff constantly there's this sort of almost desperate need to keep advancing yourselves and sound cleverer than the next person do you think this is going to pass and we're going to get into more of a realistic focused conversation or do you think this is just the way it is and the winners are those who can filter through the through the noise oh, I, I mean i think that's a good question phil right i mean all of us uh you know are trying to figure out you know you know, what, where's, the, where's the disruption going to come from? So I don't think everybody totally understands that. I mean, most companies are using, you know, I think Amazon is, is the new boogeyman, right, for most firms. You know, you know, what's that, you know, what's that threat to all of us? And then what are the tools that we're going to need, you know, to really make that, you know, internal disruptive change to address that threat? So I think, you know, it, it, it may be the new, uh, you know, the, the new reality. Um, it may be a phase. I, I think it's too early for me to tell, but I think all of us feel, you know, pressure to do things differently, whether it's to change the customer experience, to, to change cost, or to tap into uh, new revenue streams, um, you know, with information. I think there's, you know, we're, we're all trying to really push to figure out, you know, you know what is that next thing, and, and how do we make sure that we're uh, maybe not at the cutting edge, but we're at the leading edge so that, you know, we can help our organization navigate that change. Yeah, and um, Dave Brown, you know, do you do you concur that we're going through a phase, or or is this the way it's going to be from now on? And is this just is this just is this just gravy train for the consultants? <laughs> yeah. um, you know, I, I don't think it's a phase. I think it's going to become a way of life. Um, we have we have clients right now that we're starting to set up what we're calling workforce shaping um, ecosystems, and what what does that mean is. The new norm is there's multi um, avenues or channels for companies to actually provide their or to get their supply of um, uh, resources, whether that's third parties, whether that's, um, you know, contractors, you know, we, we're seeing an increase in some of the, even the, the crowdsourcing that the clients themselves are taking on. Third parties have that set up now where they're actually contracting that out, some of their code development and other areas you know, through crowdsourcing. So I think we're seeing this as becoming a new normal. I think that's part of the challenge, though, is you know, we're seeing it as becoming part of the new normal, and people aren't don't have a structure in place to deal with the change. And we talked about this early on in, the, in this broadcast. The pace of change is faster now than it ever has been. And that's not just the technology coming in, but it's the impact on the workforce. And we are, we're seeing solutions popping up all over the place where you've got these mom and pops that are starting to actually look at how do I, how do I better use technologies out there to actually bring together a workforce that has these scarce skills and maybe they're under contract for a period of time. And, and Rich, I, I go back to your point about looking at some of the scarce ones that you're talking about with you know, cyber and, and data security. You then start got to be thinking to yourself, well, what's, what am I doing to protect myself if I am looking at this workforce ecosystem, right? Who do I, am I really contracting with? We know there's lots of strict rules and regulations out there, especially out of the U.S., and what those employment laws are, and definitely across uh, Europe. So it's becoming a, um, I wouldn't say it's a phase. I think it's becoming the new normal, but there's a lot of regulatory um, and structure that needs to get put in place for a company to be agile and be able to respond to it. It's interesting, isn't it? Um, so, so Rich, uh, do you feel we're in danger of becoming an industry of generalists where people start to spread themselves a mile wide and an inch deep or, and we need to get more focused on specializing in particular areas and technologies? Or do you think it's OK to kind of have this sort of, you know, wafer thin veneer of everything that's happening? Um, you know, I, I, again, it's 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 always a mix for me, right? And I'm, I'll give the, uh, the you know, kind of wishy-washy answer, I guess. Um, we, we, you need people that can go deep in areas, right? And you need some of those people in your organization. We have them today, right? Because they're invaluable, you know, when, when, when you have challenges. But you also need people that understand, you know, uh, the partner landscape, that understand the, uh, you know, you know, how to work back inside the organization. So it's, 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 it's a mix for me because, and, and again, it, it, it kind of ties back into the whole, you know, you know, diversity of thought conversation is, is you need, you need a balance of, of, of different skills, different perspectives, because, you know, it really protects you from, from some of those blind spots. And I think, you know, the way, uh, you know, with the pace of change, with, you know, where technology is going, with where, you know, organizations are trying to go, I think there's a lot more blind spots than ever before. 
And if you don't have a, a good mix of, of, of people at, at, you know, at the different levels with the different conversations, I, th I think your risk profile goes up a lot. And so, you know, it's, like I said, it's kind of a wishy-washy answer, but I mean, we're, we're looking for more, you know, diversity of thought, um, you know, you know, globally, uh, you know, be, beca because there, there, there is more risk, I think, now than ever of, uh, you know, of a miss, you know, resulting from, from, from this change that we're going through. Okay. And I've got a good question came in from the audience, Richard, I think you'd be good to answer, which is how do you see the future leaders who are driving such change to the organizations? You know, how do they, what do these people look like in your, in your view? I mean, it starts, I think I, I, I talked a little bit about, you, you gotta be, you gotta be curious. You gotta have, uh, you know, uh, managerial courage. Um, you've, you've, you've gotta, uh, you know, be able to work, you know, in a, in a complex environment, you know, a, a global, uh, a global environment. Um, you, you have to be able to take feedback, um, you know, process, you know, lots of information, you know, and make, and make, uh, make decisions. I think, you know, you're looking for people with those, with those capabilities so that you can build them and mold them, you know, to, to your organization. Um, you know, I think they're going to have more experiences outside of your organization um, and they're going to have broader perspectives. And I think, you know, that that's a lot of, I think, what we're looking for, right? I mean, it's, and sometimes you feel like maybe you're looking for a unicorn. Um, but, you know, when I talk to, uh, you know, people coming up, you know, I say, you know, you know, you, you've got to go beyond your function, you know, and have a way back in. Um, if that's really what you want to do, do you, do you want to be the CIO? Um, do you want to be the CFO of your organization? And, you know, you've really got to be thoughtful in kind of how you plan that out and really build your network, right? I mean, this conversation today really, you know, is, is as much about, you know, uh, you know, helping people on their journey and, and, and building the network because, you know, uh, we, we need each other, uh, especially in, in these times of change um, be, be, because, you know, uh, to, I think today's point, you know, it's, it's going to continue to change and, and uh, uh, you know, we, we're going to need those people to really help us, uh, you know, get to the next level. Okay. Thank you, Rich. And um, talking about, um, you know, sort of murky, you know, sifting through the fog a bit, you know, we have Saurabh here, who's one of our leading experts in blockchain, is on a lot of work trying to understand use cases. And we've had some fierce arguments internally about um, where blockchain is headed. And Saurabh, maybe you could just share in some of the time we have left. Um, what do you think is real versus hype as we look at the impacts of blockchain? Um, sure. Um, yeah. So I think I think blockchain is is like most of these emerging technologies. I think there's a lot of hype. Uh, unfortunately, that is uh, going around there. Um, and uh, right now, blockchain is one of those things that is being thrown at everything. So if you have a cold and a cough, you throw blockchain and you hope that it will it will improve your conditions. But Obviously, no one technology can be the silver bullet uh, for for everything, and I think one of the one of the huge issues that's out there in in the market right now is just an assortment of random use cases where it makes no sense uh, for something like blockchain to be used, and that's why we've uh, um, we've come up with what we call the blockchain bullshit buster. Uh, which is essentially a set of 10 questions uh, and depending on uh, whether you answer yes or no, you'll sort of get to know um, whether you're hitting blockchain gold or whether you're sort of in the dumps. Uh, but having said that, uh, I think blockchain is also moving from from this sort of phase of uh, tourism to, to more realism, right? I think uh, uh, we're starting to see a, a number of credible sort of in production blockchain solutions. Uh, we've seen Microsoft uh, loyalty payments uh, that was recently launched, which is now in production. Uh, we saw VTrade uh, now doing actual uh, trade processing with, uh, with a few banks. Uh, and uh, we know of at least eight or 10 such examples which are moving into production. We obviously cannot disclose all of them right now. But uh, it's a very interesting space. So there is definitely hype uh, there, Phil. Uh, but at the same time, I think uh, the industry is moving very, very fast. Uh, so I think the, the cost of ignoring it is much more than the cost of investigating it right now. Thank you. I think you hit a point there quite significantly. So 
I think in the time we have left, uh, I'd like to ask each of the panelists today to um, have a one guess at what we're going to talk about if we rerun this survey again, like the ninth year in running next year. Um, so maybe Dave, would you like to finish off? What do you, what do you think we'll be talking about this time next year? I think we're going to be talking more about cognitive solutions, but I, I guarantee you that we won't be talking about the people side in the back end. People side will get me put more to the forefront. That's my thought right now. Okay. Rich, uh, you know, big thing we'll be talking about in another year. Yeah, I, I think, you know, agree with Dave on the AI. I, I also think we're going to be talking about, you know, uh, you know, RPA run wild, you know, so you're going to have a lot of, you know, companies that are in, uh, you know, their, their second, third, fourth, you know, in financial services, you know, fifth and sixth year of experience. And, you know, there's going to be the whole, you know, how do we retool the bots? Um, because I think, you know, it's going to have critical mass and people are going to kind of reevaluate, you know, how that's impacting their, uh, their, their infrastructure. So I think there's going to be, you know, bot 2.0 next year. But 2.0, I, I think I'm, I'm agreeing with you there. I also think we'll be talking about these super intelligent um, bot assistants. I, I try not to call them chat bots, but I do see um, the momentum there, particularly in areas like HR and finance, for example, becoming increasingly talked about. And then last but certainly not least, Saurabh, uh, thank you very much for your contributions and helping organize today. Uh, the big thing we'll be talking about in a year's time? Uh, I think it, I think we'll be talking about how all these emerging technologies are intersecting each other, uh, as we call the AAA trifecta of automation, uh, AI, and uh, analytics, and uh, what's the sort of resulting business outcomes. Uh, so I think, I, or I hope, we are talking about integrated solutions versus uh, piecemeal solutions, and I also hope we are not talking about quantum computing next year. <laughs> But it's such a great excuse. Blame it all on quantum computing. So um, this has been a fantastic conversation. I uh, really appreciate it, everybody who's dialed in, several hundred of you dialed in, and you can download a copy of these slides and a recording if you go to hfsresearch.com. We'll probably have it up within about 24 hours. And I'd like to personally thank Rich for his time today. Really appreciate you and your thoughts, and Dave Brown, uh, for doing his piece and really enjoyed hearing from you and Saurabh as well. So thank you everybody and I look forward very much to uh, hearing from everybody again very soon.